All right, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Excited to have you here with us. And before we dive into our message, uh, just a few announcements for you. Actually, we have a whole bunch of them during this season, uh, but I've got, I think, four announcements for you. Uh, First of all, this Monday, December 21st, in our front parking lot, there's going to be a food truck called Chef Dane, D-A-N-E. And Chef Dane actually parks there every Monday and uses our parking lot as a way for them to generate some business during these COVID times. Uh, But as a thank you to us for letting us are letting them use our parking lot. They've said we'd like they'd like to do a fundraiser night for us, and then uh, we decided to have this fundraiser go towards benefiting Nourishing Network. And so this Monday, December 21st, from about 5 to 6 or 6:30 p.m., the food truck is going to be there, and 15% of all proceeds that they earn will go towards benefiting uh, one of our ministry partners, Nourishing Network, that helps uh, give food to families in the Edmonds School District. So if you want to support a local business and help fight hunger in our community, I'd encourage you to participate in this. You can go to their website at chefdane.com slash food truck. You place your order there. They've got all kinds of sandwiches. They also have kind of take and bake meals. And then Monday night, you'll come and pick it up. Just make sure when you're putting in your order, uh, you put in the location of uh, Edmonds uh, near Hickman Park, and that'll be our parking lot. And so you can help support uh, our ministry partner and uh, this local business. So that's Monday night. Uh, the next uh, announcement is to remind you that the Faileys are currently uh, selling their worship CDs. They put together an awesome uh, compilation of worship songs, uh, many of them that we sing here uh, in church. Some of them are new. Uh, John even has an original song that he wrote. And then uh, Emily Faley's song that she wrote and we sang a couple Easter's ago is in there as well. Uh, My family's been listening to it in the car on our way to school every day. And it's just a great way for us to kind of get in a a spirit of worshiping the Lord and uh, just a very soothing mix of songs, really relaxing and and enjoyable songs. So those are uh, $10. I think we've been putting $15. You can give any amount that you want, really. And then uh, John and Tanya have said they want all the proceeds of that to go towards Vision House. So uh, we're going to be writing Vision House a check uh, from those sales. And there are some available today. If you want to grab one on your way out, uh, talk to John or Tanya. And then you can call the office uh, during the week if you'd like one. Uh, You can pick one up. Molly or I can help you with that during the week. So those are still uh, ongoing sales for that. Next announcement is uh, the women's study. Uh, My mom has agreed to do another women's study online. Uh, This will be starting January 12th. It happens on Tuesday evenings at 7 p.m. through Zoom. And they're going to be going through a handful of psalms. It's about an eight-week study, I believe. Uh, They just finished up Colossians, and that was a really good study. The ladies who were in it told me they really enjoyed it. Uh, So any women that want to sign up for that, please let me know, and we'll get you on the list and then we can email you the link uh, before that starts. And then lastly, just a reminder that uh, our Christmas Eve service this year, we're not going to be doing one in person, but we do have a wonderful Christmas Eve service uh, getting prepared uh, that will be online for you. And pretty much it will be available all day or most of the day on December 24th. So you can access it anytime that you have a moment and really want to uh, focus on God, focus on the Lord, and prepare your heart uh, uh, to be in a real Christmas mood, not just kind of all the superficial stuff, but really to celebrate and worship Jesus. I'm really excited to see how this uh, turns out. Uh, I've uh, done the sermon for it, and I was there when the kids and teens did their readings. Uh, We're going to have one of our teens give a beautiful piano piece, and then, of course, uh, John and Tanya and their family are doing the music with the worship team. And, uh, and so I'm really looking forward to it. And I know that our family will be watching it December 24th. So I really hope that you'll take advantage of that as well. So our Christmas Eve service is online this year. Uh, that's the announcements I have for you today. Why don't we pray and then we'll get in uh, to the message. Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you that we can take a moment to focus on you, to hear your word. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us. I pray that you would quicken our hearts. uh, Show us your light, Lord. Help us to know you more, especially during this time, Lord, 
uh, with all the craziness, but especially as we begin to celebrate Christmas, pray, Lord, that you'd speak to us. Bless us, Lord, we pray. Amen. So I want to uh, start today's message with a little bit of a activity or game. I'm going to read to you a handful of phrases, and your job is to figure out what do all these phrases have in common. Okay, so here are the phrases. First one says, I will always love you. Next one says, I want to know what love is. Can't help falling in love. You give love a bad name. Love is all you need. Crazy little thing called love. Stupid love. I love me. Love yourself. I just called to say, I love you. Uh, what do those phrases all have in common? They're talking about love. Anything else? There's song titles. There you go. Very good. Uh, so today we're moving on with our uh, fourth and final attribute of the Advent season. We've been going through all the different attributes of the Advent wreath or the candles that we light. We started with hope, talking about uh, the fact that this is a confidence or a certainty we have that God will fulfill his promises to us. We talked about peace, that we can find peace with God and with others through Jesus Christ. Uh, last week, Phil talked to us about joy, that it's more than happiness, more than just this endorphin rush. Instead, it's an understanding of a right standing before God, thanks to Jesus. And then today, we're talking about love. Now, love is one of the most common uh, topics when it comes to songs and poems and books and movies, uh, but it's also one of the most misunderstood topics. So today, I'm going to be asking, well, what is love? Uh, especially according to the Bible. Uh, where do we see love show up in the Christmas story? Where do we see love show up in our life? And then lastly, what are we supposed to do with the gift of love that God has given to us in Jesus? So first of all, what is love? Now in contemporary culture, uh, most of the time when people talk about love, they're talking about an emotion or a feeling. Right? Especially in our Western society, we have these romantic ideas that you're supposed to fall in love with the right person. And if you find and meet that right person, they can be the one that you will spend the rest of your life with happily ever after. Uh, last uh, couple months, I think, uh, my wife and I got sucked into watching a couple episodes of The Bachelorette. Now, this is confession time here for you. Uh, I don't really enjoy those shows. I think they're, they're kind of garbage. Sorry if you like them. Um, uh, but we were so drawn to the fact that the producers did this amazing job of really dramatizing their previews, right? And here was this bachelorette that supposedly broke the Bachelor franchise. And so we're like, all right, well, you know, we're curious enough to watch a couple episodes. And so sure enough, we watched the first few. And uh, after the very first episode, this bachelorette... Uh, claims that she knows or, or believes that she has met the one, right? After seeing this guy one time, she knows that he's the one for her. She's going to marry him. And, of course, that just completely ruins the rest of the show because uh, it <laughs> takes away all the uh, 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 suspense for it. Uh, but our contemporary society believes in this very strongly, right, that if you find the one, you will be happy for the rest of your life with that person, Unfortunately, that's not the description of love we have in the Bible. Instead, when the Bible talks about love, it talks about it in four different terms. There are four Greek terms particularly that are used. The first one is eros. Eros is a sensual and sometimes romantic kind of love. Oftentimes, it's translated in the New Testament as passion or sometimes translated as lust uh, most of the time, really, it's talking about an infatuation with somebody. And so usually when it's talking about eros, it's something that's either discouraged in the Bible or something that said, hold this until marriage. 
right? And then when we look at uh, even in the Old Testament with the Song of Solomon, this is the book that people think, oh, this shows us, you know, romantic love in the Bible. And yet when you read that book over and over again, the refrain, the chorus is, uh, be careful, don't awaken love until you're ready for it. It's this powerful, intense emotion and yet emotions can be fleeting, they can be deceptive, and so we're warned about it and said, be cautious with this. Don't let yourself be overtaken with these feelings of eros, believing that this is what true love is. Instead, there are three other descriptions of love that help us understand deeper and deeper realities of what love is supposed to be like. The next one is storge or storge, and this is a family love or familial love. It's the kind of love that connects you to your parents and your grandparents and your brothers and sisters. Oftentimes, this love is translated as devotion. It involves supporting one another, taking care of each other, protecting each other, sharing with one another. In Romans 12.10, it uses this verb when it says, be devoted to one another. But then it goes on and says, to one another in brotherly love, which is the next kind of love, philia. Philia love is a deeper kind of personal connection with somebody. It's a more intimate uh, trust and respect for one another. Uh, it's the kind of person that you can confide in and lean on in times of trouble. Uh, this is the kind of love that uh, John uses in John 13, 35. He says, by this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you philia one another, right? Have this kind of deep connection and, and care for one another. Uh, there's a verse in the Old Testament that says, uh, there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother, right? Uh, we don't get to choose our families, uh, and we love our families on, on one level, but oftentimes we enjoy hanging out with our friends more than our families. And, uh, and the kind of friendship that we have with with people that we choose to surround ourselves with usually is more meaningful because we feel uh, that trust and that respect with them. The last kind of love is the agape love. This is the kind of love you've probably heard about, talk about in, the, in uh, sermons before. And most of the time when agape is used, it's used to describe God's love for us. This is a pure and selfless and sacrificial kind of love unconditional, without anything to gain. This is the kind of love that John talks about in John 3.16, when he says, for God so agapeo, agape, or loved the world, that he sent his one and only son. Paul uses it in Romans 5.8. God demonstrates his own agape for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 3.16 uses it as well. This is how we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. So when we see these kinds of love, most of the time when culture's talking about love, it's really only talking about that eros. But when the Bible talks about it, it calls us to go into these deeper levels of love until we are embracing and receiving and reflecting that agape love, a selfless love, a sacrificial love. For those of you who have the privilege of calling yourselves parents, uh, you know what that love is. It's not just a warm, fuzzy feeling you have for your kids. It's the willingness to sacrifice for them day in and day out, even when they're not all that lovable, right? When they're uh, puking up vomit and their noses are runny and all these other things, you continue to give yourself for them out of this selfless desire to love them, to give them a better future than even you yourself had. That's what is uh, talked about when it talks about agape love. So God is calling us to these deeper kinds of love. Uh, back when I was a teen, uh, I used to listen to DC Talk. And those of you who don't know DC Talk, this was the band that Toby Mac was a part of. And some of you don't even know who Toby Mac is. That's okay. Uh, but uh, they had a song called Love is a Verb. And the point was, love is an action. It's not just an emotion. Emotions are part of it, and they're part of God's design, but it's something that goes deeper, a commitment to care for somebody, to give yourself for their good, even if it means sacrificing your own good. So then how does God's love, this agape love, show up in the Christmas story? 
I want to show you seven uh, quick snapshots of places where God's love shows up in the Christmas stories. First of all, we have God's love showing up when God uh, reveals himself to Zechariah and to Elizabeth. Now, if you remember, Zechariah and Elizabeth were barren. They weren't able to have any kids. And they had longed for kids and prayed for kids until the point that they had gotten old and well beyond the age of uh, being able to have kids. But early in the Christmas story in Luke chapter 1, God shows up to Zechariah in the form of an angel and tells him, your wife Elizabeth will bear a son and he will be a joy and delight to you and many will rejoice because of his birth. So God pours out his love by granting Elizabeth and Zechariah this desire of theirs, these things that they had wanted in their hearts for a long, long time. And not only does he answer their prayers and give them a child, but he gives them a child that will be great. The angel says, he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. He will go on before the Lord to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So this son becomes John the Baptist who prepares the way for Jesus. He's considered the greatest prophet in the whole Bible because of his role in announcing and preparing people's hearts for Jesus. So this is God's love poured out on Zechariah and Elizabeth. The next place we see it is when God uh, sends the angel to visit Mary. Now, when the angel visits Mary, he tells her, you are highly favored or highly loved by God. And the Lord is with you. He's saying God has chosen you for a very special task. Right? Mary was a nobody, a peasant girl, probably from a poor family in a very small town, in a very small country, occupied by the Roman Empire. And she had no standing or social status, and yet God chooses her. And when she hears this, uh, she sings out and cries out in the Magnificat and says, My soul glorifies the Lord, for he has been mindful of his humble servant. And from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Even though it would have been very difficult and challenging for Mary, she considers it a great honor and a blessing to be chosen by God. Now, the other way that God shows his love in this particular story is by sending the angel. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, uh, but God does a lot of things in my life without ever announcing them to me ahead of time, right? Uh, a lot of changes that have happened to me, a lot of things that I've gone through, uh, but he's never sent an angel to let me know that they're coming. Every now and then I'll have a sense that something's coming, but never a very clear directive or announcement, this is coming, be prepared. Well, imagine if Mary hadn't had the visit of the angel, Right? One day she wakes up and she's feeling kind of queasy, right? And, and it keeps persisting morning after morning. And then her stomach starts to swell and she's going, what is going on with my body, right? Uh, I can't be pregnant, so I must be sick or have some kind of disease. Uh, but none of that happens because Mary knows exactly what to expect. The angel told her about it. And not just any angel, but Gabriel, one of the highest angels, uh, one of only three angels mentioned by name in the Bible, and he tells her exactly what's happening, tells her that this child will be the son of God, what an incredible gift and blessing. And so even just the visit of the angel is God pouring out his love on Mary, helping her prepare herself for what's to come, helping her even get ready for the criticism and the rebuke and the stares and the gossip that are coming her way from the townspeople and her family members. Uh, so the angel itself is, is a blessing and an act of love towards Mary. Uh, the next one is the fact that the angel visits Joseph as well. Again, this is a blessing for Joseph, just the fact that he gets to see an angel. Uh, I've never personally seen an angel that I know of. Uh, I know about a handful of people who have, and, and most people think this is an incredible treasure or blessing that you get to experience this, and Joseph has that experience here. Uh, but this is especially a blessing for Mary, because remember, Joseph was thinking about divorcing her, breaking off the engagement. And if he hadn't had this visit from the angel, this revelation from God, then he would have followed through with that divorce and Mary would have been left completely alone. Instead, God shows Joseph, this is what's happening. You need to marry Mary. 
and he goes through with the wedding, and she now has the comfort of a husband. She has somebody to provide for her, somebody to protect her, and probably even more importantly, she has somebody who believes her, somebody who knows that what she's saying is true, because I'm guessing nobody else, even her own parents, believed her. In fact, we don't hear anything about her parents, and so possibly they even disowned her, uh, but Joseph attaches himself to her and, and is with her during this incredibly challenging or difficult time. So what a blessing, what an act of love for God to provide this uh, for Mary by sending the angel to tell Joseph what is happening. The number uh, four story is when Mary visits her Elizabeth. Now, uh, it's a little bit confusing depending on uh, where you're looking in the Bible, but uh, Mary's visit to Elizabeth could have happened before the dream that Joseph had, or it could have happened afterwards. Uh, but regardless, Mary goes up and spends uh, a handful of months with Elizabeth, who is her relative, some kind of distant cousin or an aunt or something. And this visit en ends up being an incredible blessing and encouragement to her. Remember, the first time she shows up, uh, John the Baptist in um, Elizabeth's tummy begins jumping around and, and dancing around. And, and Elizabeth sees this as a sign from God. She sees this that God is saying that Mary is carrying the Messiah. And she begins prophesying over Mary and declaring that she will give birth to the Son of God, to the Messiah. And I imagine for Mary that would have been such an encouragement to have, again, somebody who believes her. Somebody who kind of knows what she's going through because she herself is going through this miracle pregnancy. And then somebody who will declare this truth over her to remind her and assure her this truly is from God. And then beyond that, Mary also gets to witness the birth of John the Baptist. And so this is kind of like her Lama's class, right? She gets to be there and see how it's done and, and what needs to happen. And this is preparation for her when she will give birth uh, in the stable, and then also just for raising uh, baby Jesus, seeing Elizabeth in the first uh, couple weeks uh, with John the Baptist. So what a blessing for Mary to have this. Next one, then, is actually the journey uh, to Bethlehem. Now, a few weeks ago, I read to you kind of my own little version of what that would have been like and how difficult that would have been. But in some ways, we can think of this journey itself as a blessing to Mary and Joseph. And one of the things I think of is the fact that the Bible prophesied in the Old Testament that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Now, this is a little bit of speculation, but I'm guessing after Mary heard she was going to be giving birth to the Messiah, the first thing she did is went up and looked up all of the verses that talked about the Messiah. Of course, they only had the Torah in those days. And so she probably poured over those and was researching, trying to figure it out. And it's possible that when uh, she and Joseph were talking about the birth of Jesus, they would have said, well, it says he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. Well, how are we supposed to get to Bethlehem? Like, shouldn't we just stay here in Nazareth? It seems safer, right? But when the census comes, they have to go. And so it's almost like God is telling them here, I will take care of these things. You don't have to manufacture anything. You don't have to worry about fulfilling these things. I will fulfill all the prophecies. I will fulfill everything that needs to be done through this person, through the Son of God, this Messiah. Beyond this, too, it would have been a blessing because now Mary and Joseph, uh, who are receiving kind of the stares and, and gossip and criticism from all their town, all those people now have something else to worry about. And so the attention is taken away from them. And not only that, but now there are people to travel with them to Bethlehem. It would have taken them about five or seven days uh, to get there. But because other people are traveling back to their hometowns, it would have been a safer time to travel because of those other people on the road. And then finally, a number of years ago, I read a book talking about uh, inns in those days. Remember when Mary and Joseph got to Bethlehem, there was no room for them at the inn. And this researcher was saying, you know, in those days, an inn was more like a youth hostel than it was a hotel, right? So it, when you would check into an inn, you wouldn't necessarily get your own room with a bathroom and your own privacy and, and amenities. Instead, it would just be this big common room with 30, 40 other people all crammed into the floor. You get a tiny little piece of the floor and it's noisy and it's crowded and smelly and all these people have been traveling all day. And many of them are strangers. But for them to have a stable instead of an inn 
was probably actually better because it offered them that privacy, that quiet, uh, that safe space away from all these other people. And so in some ways, even the stable could have been a blessing to Mary and Joseph. Number six, God shows his love and pours out his love in the Christmas story on the shepherds. If you remember, shepherds in those days were kind of nobodies. They were kind of at the bottom rung of society, uh, forgotten by most people, just up in the hills on their own most of the time. But when God shows up, he has this angel appear to the shepherds and then a whole host of angels that are singing and praising God. Now, I love to listen to John and Tanya lead us in worship and their family too. Uh, when I was at Point Loma in college, uh, our college used to do Handel's Messiah with the whole music department. I loved listening to that. Uh, in Panama, our church would join with about 20 other churches and do this big old Christmas cantata. And I always loved listening to those choirs. But I imagine that none of those things can compare to a host of angels singing the very first Christmas hymns, right? I mean, what an incredible experience. What an incredible blessing for these shepherds to know that they have not been forgotten by God, that he truly cares for them and remembers them, and here he is declaring the greatest news of all to these guys up in the hills. And then not only that, but they get to go and be the very first eyewitnesses of the Messiah, of the Son of God, and they get to go out and share the good news with others. And who knows, we, they may even have brought gifts to Mary and Joseph. You know, a lot of the nativity sets show them offering a lamb or some wool or maybe some milk. Or who knows, maybe they even helped in the delivery because they're used to delivering sheep or something. Uh, but what a blessing all around for the shepherds and for Mary and Joseph to have this confirmation. These guys coming and saying, the angels told us we would see your son and that he is the Messiah. And, and then declaring his praises what a confirmation to them. What an encouragement and a blessing to them. Uh, the scriptures tell us that after this, Mary ponders it in her heart. That means she held on to these memories, treasured this memory of the shepherds arriving. And it probably was an encouragement and a blessing to her for many years to come, especially as things got difficult and she struggled. Last of all, we can't forget the wise men. Uh, now, when the scriptures talk about the wise men, it says that uh, when they find Jesus, he's now a child instead of an infant or a baby, and they find him in a house. So most people uh, say that this uh, shows us that the wise men actually appeared maybe two, three, or four years after the birth. Uh, it just took them a while to get there, I guess. Some of us are slower than others to getting around to following Jesus. Uh, but these wise men, when they show up, you know, Mary and Joseph haven't had any kind of supernatural things happen in the last two, three years. It's been a while since Jesus was born. Uh, they're now trying to figure out life in Bethlehem, trying to find a new job for Joseph, had to find a new home for him. And, and possibly, you know, they're just getting discouraged and going, is this what it's like to raise the Son of God? Like, it's kind of no different than any of my other neighbors. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we have these uh, foreign magistrates, these dignitaries that show up, and they've just had an audience with the king, and they bow down and they worship their son. And then they offer him gifts, that gold and frankincense and myrrh. A couple of weeks ago, I was uh, shopping for Christmas cards for my nieces and nephews. I like to get them funny cards at Christmas. Uh, that's just a good uncle thing to do. Uh, but one of the cards I saw was the, and you've probably seen it too, it's the one that says, what if the wise men had been wise women, right? And so they show these, uh, these women kings offering Jesus a bag of diapers or some formula or a casserole, right? These very practical gifts. Uh, but in many ways, the offerings of the magi, the gold, frankincense, and myrrh, those probably were very practical as well in the sense that they were very valuable, and as Mary and Joseph had to flee into Egypt, this was currency that they could use in any country. And probably this provided for their family for the next 20 years or so. And so it gave Mary and Joseph everything that they needed to care for their son, even as they're fleeing and running away from Herod and all those other things. And then what an incredible reassurance and blessing to them that Jesus truly is meant to be the king of the world that people from the east would travel great distances to pay homage to him and worship him. 
What a blessing to Mary and Joseph as Jesus' parents in this situation see that God's word truly is true. And, and what a blessing and encouragement to them. So all of those things are just examples and stories that show us God pouring out his love at Christmas time on all of these people involved in these stories. So then what about us? All right, where does God's love show up for us, uh, especially surrounding Christmas and the Christmas stories? Well, just like Mary, the Bible tells us that God has chosen us. He's elected us to save us and redeem us. Just like the shepherds, God has revealed his good news to us, letting us know that the Son of God has come. Just like the wise men, he has invited us to follow him and to worship him. Of course, the greatest gift and the greatest act of love at Christmas is Jesus, God's own Son, sent down to us, inviting us into this relationship with him. Oftentimes when we read the Old Testament, we think that God looks a little bit scary or intimidating. And rightfully, he had to reveal himself as holy and righteous to his people and, and all-powerful. But in Jesus, God invites us into a new stage of relationship with him. A personal, intimate relationship. God is no longer far off and distant and scary and intimidating. Instead, he's inviting He's humble and gentle. In Jesus, and particularly at Christmas in the form of baby Jesus, God shows himself as a gentle, caring, loving God. For God to send his son, his most uh, treasured possession, was an incredible gift, uh, an incredible sacrifice. For Jesus himself to come down was an incredible sacrifice as well. When theologians talk about the incarnation of Jesus, they mention the fact that for Jesus to come down and be one of us, he had to forsake his heavenly or divine form. Now, the Bible tells us that God is spirit, which means that he has no form. He can't be contained in any one little uh, container or box. But for Jesus to come down, he had to give up that divine spirit form or lack of form and now be contained in a tiny little vessel of baby Jesus. The God of the universe, infinite, is now contained in a very small little space. And theologians say that for Jesus to do this wasn't just to give up his divine form for a handful of years, 30 years or so. It was actually a sacrifice that he gave up for the rest of eternity. That when you see Jesus in the resurrection, you see his resurrected body. When you see him in Revelation, you see his glorified body. But he still has a body. He's still contained in a tiny little space rather than being the all-infinite God. So it's a sacrifice that he was willing to give up for the sake of showing us how much he loves us. The gift of Jesus is God's gift of agape love for us. So then the question is, what do we do about this gift? What do we do about the love that God has given us? Well, three quick things. We're meant to receive it. Receive the gift. Believe it. Accept it. Embrace it. Treasure it. Whether you've been following Jesus for just one day or for a whole lifetime, may you continue to treasure and embrace the gift of Jesus in your life every day of the year, not just on Christmas. Second of all, we're meant to walk in it. Colossians 2.6 says, Just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in him. Walking in Jesus means walking in the assurance of God's love. Knowing that you are loved, that God delights in you and rejoices over you. There's no more guilt or shame or fear before God. This means rooting and establishing your identity in Jesus knowing that you are valuable, not because of anything you have done or not done, not, just, not because of what you look like or how rich you are or what job you have, but because God declares you valuable in his sight because he says, I love you. That is where your identity lies. And no matter what anything anybody else says or thinks about you, it doesn't matter because the God of the universe loves you. Walking in it also means walking in obedience. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. 
This means understanding that if God loves you, as we're saying he does, then his commands for you are good. God is love. Everything he does is out of love for you. So his commands for you are going to be what is best for you. Walking in God's love is understanding that following God and obeying him isn't this shackle and and chains that's limiting your life. This is where true freedom is going to be found. So walk in that love. And lastly, share it with others. Just like the gifts that we exchange at Christmas, the gift of Jesus is meant to be shared with others. 1 John 3.16 says, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. John 13, 34 through 35 says, A new command I give you, love one another. And the verb there is agape one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. God calls us to take the love that he has given us and then pass it on to others. Share his love with others. Pass on that good news. Be willing to give your life for the sake of others coming to know Jesus too. That's what it means to love one another. That is what God calls us to. I want to close here with one last verse for you that I believe kind of sums this all up really nicely. This is John 15, 9 through 17. And these are the words of Jesus. He says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. And my command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. You did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, my Father will give to you. This is my command. Love each other. Would you please pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for your love. We thank you how clearly this is expressed to us at Christmas time in the form of baby Jesus. That you were willing to come down across such a great distance to become one of us to draw near to us, to help us to know that you are not far away, you are right here with us. Help us, Lord Jesus, to understand that. Help us to believe it deep within our soul. I pray, Jesus, for everyone here in this room with me and people who are listening at home. I pray that this Christmas you would help us to understand and know and even to feel that once again. Reveal your agape love to us anew, Lord Jesus, and help us to share it with others, that your love and your glory would fill the earth as the waters covers the sea. May you be glorified, Lord Jesus, in us this Christmas, I pray. At this time, would you please join me in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Before we go, let me read to you a quick benediction from Ephesians chapter 3. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. 
Amen. Merry Christmas, everybody. And I hope you'll join us Christmas Eve for a Christmas Eve service. God bless you.